Adam and Eve never existed, or at least that's what many modern Christian leaders are telling us. Today, we're here to set the record straight. Hi, I'm Keaton Halley, an apologist with CMI, and I'm here with Dr. Rob Carter. Uh, welcome to the program, Dr. Carter. Thanks, Keaton. Uh, in this episode, we're going to talk about human genetics and how that relates to this question of, is the biblical account of Adam and Eve feasible? Mm. Uh, let me begin with a quote here. Uh, professor Dennis Venema, he's a professor of biology at Trinity Western University. Uh, he represents a lot of people in this field that are now challenging uh, the ge genetics of Adam and Eve. He also is associated with BioLogos and a, a group dedicated to promoting evolution from That's a Christian right. perspective. Very confusing. Yeah, claim to be a uh, Christian evangelical, but uh, insist that evolution is fact. Um, and so in, in a paper in 2010, Dennis Venema said, the hypothesis that humans are genetically derived from a single ancestral pair in the recent past has no support from a genomics perspective and indeed is counter to a large body of evidence. Your response. If I had a nickel for every time I heard something like that. On the other hand, we can ask the question, what evidence are you talking about? What would we expect if Adam and Eve were true? I have never heard a Dr. Venema or, or basically anyone in that camp lay out, here's the predictions we would expect if Adam and Eve were true, and here's actually what we see. Hmm. Instead, they come at it from a completely evolutionary perspective. Here's all the stuff we expect to see in evolution. This is true, therefore evolution is true. But wait, wait a minute. You actually haven't addressed a real question. Hmm. So, if Adam and Eve were true, what would he expect? Let's see, uh, there should be only one male ancestor of all people on the planet. That's true. There should only be one female ancestor of all people on the planet. Well, that's also true. And from, from the genetic data, you're yeah, saying the genetic that this data. helps to confirm the biblical prediction. Yeah, direct biblical prediction. One male, one female. That is not a prediction of evolution. Now, after they discovered it, the evolutionists came up with this thing called the out of Africa or the African bottleneck where we lost all our diversity. That's why there's only one, but it's a direct prediction of scripture and it's staring us right in the face. Well, why don't you go into that in, in a bit more detail here? I think what you're referring to is uh, mitochondrial Eve, this term that evolutionists themselves use. Mm -hmm. And Y chromosome Adam. Y chromosome Adam, Adam. yeah. So um, can you maybe just describe for the, the audience what these terms refer to? In genetics, in our DNA, we have a piece of DNA that we only get from our fathers if you're a male. You, if you're a girl, you don't get it. It's called the Y chromosome. Yes. It's a few million letters long. And father to son to son to son to son. Yeah, because women have uh, two X chromosomes, right? And That's right. Only the males have the X, Y. X and a Y. That's right. But the Y chromosome is passed on unbroken from father to son. And every once in a while, a mistake happens. They're called mutations. The, the DNA copying machines, they're not perfect. And every time a new mistake happens, a new branch in the family tree is formed. And if you look at all the branches in the world, they go back to a single person, not to a chimpanzee to a man who lived a few thousand years ago. And it's clear, they call him Y chromosome Adam. Okay. And Same, how, about, how about with Eve? Th th for Eve, for this idea called mitochondrial Eve, if you look at all these little pieces of DNA you only get from your mother, fathers don't pass them on, but men get it from the mother, girls get it from their mother, and only the girls pass it on. It's called the mitochondrial DNA. It's a little teeny piece of DNA, only 16,000 something letters long. And again, Every couple generations, a mistake happens and a new branch forms on the family tree. Mm. But those branches collapse down to a single woman who only lived a few thousand years ago. Mm. So what you're saying in, in both of these pieces of DNA, there's less diversity uh, among all the males, for example, than the evolutionary theory predicted. Yeah, a lot less diversity. Even using the slow mutation rate that the evolutionists like to use, I disagree with that. The mutation rate is much faster and we can measure that in families. But even using a slow evolutionary mutation rate, Y chromosome Adam is not that long ago. They might put them at 100,000 years ago, but that's not millions of years ago. That's for the evolution, that's really recent and it is a challenge. Now, if we apply a real world mutation rate, something we can measure in a family, that puts Adam just a few thousand years ago. Mm. And I've heard before um, reports in the news media and so forth that Eve and Adam didn't live at the same time because they, they date mitochondrial Eve to 200,000 years ago. Uh, those dates fluctuate a little bit, but um, how do they actually arrive at these dates? 
Yeah, the dating is a very complicated uh, process filled with lots of art and assumption. Recently, the most important Y chromosome papers have used a phrase called sanity check. What they have said is the peopling of the Americas is a sanity check on any mutation rate calculation. But wait a second, that means they're using archaeology and an assumption of when people, when the Native Americans got to America to, and then they look at the Native Americans and say, here's how much diversity they have. Oh, that much diversity happens in X number of thousands of years, assuming the Ice Age happened, you know, 10,000 years ago. And that's a, because they've stretched out the timeline, it gives them a, a very slow mutation rate. So archaeology is being used to, to give us an estimate of how long ago Adam lived. Right. So in that case, they're sort of assuming a date for the Ice Age and that there was a sort of a founding start, starting couple that brought that, a group of people group that, that, that came to that the Americas about. Yeah. Right. And then looking at the diversity today and comparing it to what it must have been back then. That's how they estimate. In other words, you can't rate. look at the DNA itself and know how old it is. They're looking for other ways to estimate how old it is. Oh, wait a second then. How old is, is Y chromosome Adam then? How do we know how old he is? If we use families and look at the differences, the mutations happen too quickly. It's easy to take this whole family tree and collapse it down to Adam in 6,000 years. Yeah, and what you mean there is looking at actually measured mutation rates in the present, right? Yeah. Comparing um, grandmothers to... For the mitochondria, to, yeah. Um, their grandchildren and so yeah. forth. And then seeing how fast the mutations occur, it actually, actually is faster than their predictions often from their evolutionary assumptions. Yeah, and it works both for the mitochondria and the Y chromosome. And we get a very similar answer not that long ago. Mm. Yeah. So what no, evidence not on you, the order of 200,000 years ago, yeah, but no. more on the order of the, the biblical time frame. Yeah, so what evidence do we expect? That. Well, let's come to one of the specific claims that Venema and others have made, that there's actually too much diversity mm. um, in the human population worldwide, more than is possible from just the starting founding couple in the recent past, say, 6,000 years ago, as the Bible would indicate, an age for Adam and Eve. There's a couple different aspects to this, and it depends on what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've seen is people say, well, you could not get this much diversity in just 6,000 years because that much mutation would drive us extinct. Mm, yeah. Well, wait a minute. That's assuming that all the diversity is mutation. When we look at people around the world, there's on the order of about 10 million variants that are found in people across the world. They're very common. And they're not disease causing. So why do we have to call those mutations? What if those are the variants that God engineered into Adam? Mm. So Adam could have had a lot of diversity built into him from the beginning, genetically speaking, right? Do you want to explain how, how that's possible, even though he's a single individual? Um, sure. We carry two copies of all of our DNA. And if you look at any little piece of DNA that you got from your mother or your father, for us, we have you know, two copies of chromosome one, let's say. And if you scan down chromosome one, you'll find places where your two versions have different letters. Maybe the one you got from your father's an A and the one you got from your mother has a T. Mm -hmm. Some other place, maybe you got a C from your dad and a G from your mother. Something like that. That variation is found all over the world. You and I have about three million places, probably on that, that order, where the copy we got from our mother differs from what we got from our father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in some cases, it's the same, right? That, yeah, that's mo called. most of the places you're... you're your genome has exactly the same thing between both your parents. In about 3 million places, they differ. Yeah. So if we carry 3 million, it's easy to imagine Adam carried 10 million. Because we only have a subset of all the world's diversity. Put it into Adam, and then over time, those genetic variants spread out. In fact, that 10 million is found all over Europe, all over China, all over Africa, in the Native Americans and the Native Australians, they're found all over the world because they're in our population before we spread out, mm. which means they're on the ark, which means they're in Adam. Yeah. So just to help people understand here, I, I think what you're saying is um, Adam himself could have had a maximum at, at any specific place in his genome, a maximum of two possibilities. Two possibilities. Yeah, he's got a, or one G, copy C and, a, or T. and a backup copy yeah. that could be slightly different. Yeah. Um, so then when he passes on to his, his children, um, his children might get the one copy or they might get the other. It's, yeah. it's two possibilities. Yeah. Um, th then it could even be that Eve had more diversity 
uh, than Adam. Is that right? If you want to get into esoteric models, which some of my, my articles do uh, discuss, Eve could have had a different genome from Adam. Or God could have engineered into Adam and Eve's reproductive cells different genomes. So how much diversity is in the human population? It might depend upon how many children they had. But we don't even have to go there. We just have to have God put into Adam, about 10 million variants, and everything's explained. Yeah. So when we look today worldwide, the vast majority of places where humans do differ from one another, um, we actually only tend to have these two different yeah. Gene, gene yeah. variants, right? Mo they're they're most called alleles. Alleles. Most all the variations, only two alleles. A or C. G yeah. or T. And, a, and an allele would be like a, a flavor or a variant of one. Yeah. You know, it's the same gene for, say, coding for um, eye color, but you can have the allele to make blue eyes or the allele to make brown eyes, for example. Probably not the best example, but it brings up another issue. Um, after creation, we have thousands of years for mutations to happen. We have... Errors are in a copying apparatus, and we're all picking up mutations. And it looks like blue eyes is a mutation because it's only restricted to a certain group of people. So, in other words, it's something that happened after Babel. Right. Okay. And what about the um, exceptions to the rule where there, there are some cases, like I know evolutionists sometimes bring up these um, histocompatibility genes where they say that there's not just a handful of variants, there are several hundred alleles. Um, sure. across the human population. The human immune system has lots and lots and lots of variations amongst people. But there's 7 billion people. You think of, of how many different family trees there are as you start with Adam and you branch outwards. There's tons and tons of time for a mutation to happen over here or over here or over here. And it just so happens that this gene is highly mutable and we can survive with it. And so therefore, there's lots of variation. There's a, something else coming down the pike right now, though. It looks like we can inherit a lot of traits that we acquire while we're alive. But that mm. will be another podcast <laughs> for another day yeah, sure. because it is throwing a giant curveball into the whole evolutionary assumption. And it's, it's going to be amazing how the, this Pandora's box of problems is going to open up, not for us, but for our opponents. Mm. Yeah. So the, and the bottom line then on this, the histocompatibility genes is that they um, are used in our immune system, which makes sense that it would be beneficial to have lots of variants. And so it may be that God designed them to. It's vary within over time. the design parameters of this class of genes to be mutable on purpose. Well, it's certainly been a fascinating discussion. Do you have any final words, Rob? Sure. There is no reason to doubt biblical history. Genetics points to Adam and Eve. And to learn more, we invite you to visit creation.com, use the search engine to search for Adam or genetics. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.